Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of everybody involved in this little ministry, I want to greet you and welcome you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our study of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, uh, we, we ended last week in the first and second verse of chapter five of, of that letter. So we're going to pick it up right there at verse three, Ephesians 5, 3, right after I do this. Father, I just thank you that we have this time, that we have this time in your word. And I pray, Lord God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would indeed lead us into all truth, that we might grow closer and closer to you, that we might know you more, love you more, and be more like you. I ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And the congregation said, Amen. Hallelujah. All right, as I said, we're in Ephesians 5, and I'm going to start at verse 3, right here. I am going to do that momentarily. Ephesians 5, 3. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, and, and generally, my reference is I use, I use the New American Standard, the King James Version, the English Standard Version. And I, I, use, I go into and look at the Hebrew and Greek quite consistently to find, try and find, uh, make sure I'm getting the right meaning from it. The only caution I would make to you is that if you're using the Message Bible, and I'm generous in calling it a Bible, please don't because you will not be able to follow along with those other translations. Enough said. All right, Ephesians 5.3. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Immorality, impurity, or greed. Now, immorality in the King James, it says fornication. For the word impurity, it says uncleanness. And greed, it translates as covetousness. Now, the interesting thing about the first one, immorality, is that's the Greek word pornea, where we got our word pornog pornography. It's, it's any of that. Well, you know what it is. I think it was, I don't know which justice of the Supreme Court it was long ago who said, in a case about pornography, he said, well, I, I can't define it, but I sure know, I know it when I see it. Well, I'm sure you know it when you see it too. If the eyes of your heart are open to the truth. Okay. So remember that Paul would write to the Colossians and say, therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry, Colossians 3, 5. Greed is idolatry. And yet it seems to me that so much of the church today is promoting greed. It's called the prosperity gospel, and it is a cancer. They say, as they try and extract money from you, that God wants you to have abundance, but they have twisted a truth into a lie. You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, he said that he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. It, not, it is not about possessions. It's not about stuff. That's not what abundance is. So it says, set your mind on the things above. Store up your treasures in heaven. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 21. That's leading to be able to say, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. Psalm 73, 25. The stuff on earth is going to perish. It absolutely is. And as Paul said, as Job said, you can't take it with you. Naked you came into the world, naked you're going out. This is not Egypt where you try and bury your stuff with you. You know, I pray it's not. That's what God delivered us from. So I, I want to talk, just as an aside, talking about abundance, having enough. Are you familiar with the account of Gideon? that valiant warrior. If you look in Judges chapter 7, 
And I'm going to read from verse 1. It says, Then Jeroboam, that's Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and camped beside the spring of Harad. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them by the hill of Marah in, in the valley. This is when the Midianites were attacking the Israelites, right? And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. For Israel would become boastful, saying that my own power has delivered me. Now, therefore, come, proclaim in the hearing of, people and, of the people and say, Whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 people returned, but 10,000 remained. Gideon just lost more than half of his army. Then the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Therefore it shall be that he of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, he shall go with you. But everyone of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, You shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink. Now the number of those who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people kneeled to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, I will deliver you with the 300 men who left and will give the Midianites into your hands. So let all the other people go, each man to his home. Now, in, in chapter 8, verse 28, it says this. So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel, and they did not lift up their heads anymore. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. An abundance of faith, an abundance of obedience, that was the answer. That still is the answer. Abundance is not about having more and more and more. It's about having the right amount. Because if they had more and more and more, they would have boasted in what they had accomplished. You know, I, I've said this many times, that we haven't been blessed here. I mean, Bible Talk is basically a missionary ministry. And we have traveled in many, many places in the world bringing the good news of Jesus Christ, preaching and teaching the word. And to be quite frank, we don't have a lot of resources. I do not have enough money that I can just say, well, I think I'll go to this place or I'll go to that place or I'll do this or I'll do that because I'm not able on my own. We have to seek God. If I feel that God is telling us that we, want to, we need to go someplace to do what he wants, then I trust that he'll supply what we need. But I don't have the ability to step out on my own without him. That's a blessing. I promise you that's a blessing. Abundance is about having the right amount. What's the right amount? Well, you and God, what more do you need exactly? In verse 4, it says, And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. Filthiness and silly talk. The King James says foolish talk. Think about this. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, it says in Proverbs 10. And it also says in that chapter, the tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where your treasure is, your heart is. It is about what you, what's in your heart that is revealed by what's in your mouth. There is no excuse for filthy or foolish talk in the mouth of a believer. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and you and I have been entrusted with life. I cannot believe in the culture around us today the filth that pours out of people's mouths. I mean, I, it's just hard to imagine. You know, I don't want to get too far into this, but in 1939, one of the, 1939 was a big movie year because people were into entertainment before the war started. And I mean, The Wizard of Oz was made in 39, but Gone with the Wind, one of the big classics of all time, was made in 39. And I don't know if you know this, but I, I think the final line, I mean, I'm not an expert on the movie at all, but I do know this. Uh, Rhett Butler, 
who was not Cary Grant, uh, Clark Gable, said to his wife when she said said something to him, he said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And I'll tell you what, the world freaked out. I mean, he used the profanity there publicly. Well, have you been to a movie lately? I mean, it's hard to find a movie that doesn't have, it's hard to find a television show in this day and age that's not filled with profanity. Filth. Let's call it what it is. And it is indeed filth. There's just no excuse for foolish or filthy talk in the mouth of a believer. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And you and I have been entrusted with life, as I said. We should bring words of life into the lives of other people. Of course, jesting it talks about. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, Was I not joking? Proverbs 26. You know, we have to be careful about every word that proceeds from our mouths. You can't afford to be sloppy in your talk. Okay? Of course, Justin, you really need to have dirty jokes. You really need to have coarse. It doesn't even, it doesn't have to have filth. It's just coarse. It's, it's, it, it grates against you. It grates against the, the spirit of a believer or it should. Is that fun? Well, you know, joy, joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If that doesn't bring you fun, joy, I don't, I don't know what's the matter with you. And then in that verse, he talks about the giving of thanks. Now, we've talked about what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 so many times in the past, where Paul says, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That is so very, very true. But now here in Ephesians, he writes, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Down in verse 20 of this fifth chapter, all right? For all things. Do you believe that the Lord is in control of the events in your life? That's a question you need to answer. He is, unless you're in rebellion. If you're not in rebellion, I promise you, God is in control of all of the events in your life. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's what it says in Philippians 2.13. God is at work in you. He's working his purpose. He's working his pleasure. He's working his plan. Do you believe that? Jesus certainly believed it, even when he faced Pontius Pilate, who said, I have the authority to put you to death. And Jesus said, you have no authority unless my father gave it to you. My father's in control. Now, as God's people had been sent off into the Babylonian captivity. Now that was punishment for their disobedience, for their hard heartedness. God said to them through the prophet Jeremiah, he said, for I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. So the thing is, no matter what it looks like, we can give thanks in the midst of the trials and tribulations for the trials and tribulations because it is written and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord, love the God, and those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. If you have that assurance that you know it's going to work for good, that should relieve you of all anxiety. And Jesus said, be anxious for nothing. It should take away all the fear in your life. And it should give you the ability to give thanks in all of the things in your life. And don't just thank him. Rejoice always, as it says in 1 Thessalonians. You should be praising God. You should be rejoicing in the Lord, no matter what goes on in your life. I promise you, God responds to that. Why? Because he responds to his word. If you don't believe that, write to me and ask me for a copy of the book. The Master's Call. And I'll show you how he responds. All right, let me go on to the next verse. 
Ephesians 5, 5 says, For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. No inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. That means they're not saved. They're not going to heaven. They're not going to be with him. They're not saved. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? The gospel of here and now is the gospel that's being preached in so many places, in so many churches, in so many denominations. It's all about getting stuff here and now. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with getting stuff here and now, but it's got to be God's will, not because you're making demands on God. Abundance is not about, Jesus said, you know, even when a man has abundance, his, his, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. It's not about what you have, because you don't own anything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It all belongs to him. It's a matter of having what you need to accomplish God's purpose in your life. If your focus is God's purpose in your life, anything that you have will bring joy to you, because I promise you it will suffice. It will be sufficient because what God calls you to, he will equip you for. Moving right along to the next verse. Ephesians 5 verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let no one deceive you with empty words. What's an empty word? Your words are supposed to carry something important. What? Life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your words, in your heart, God has poured his life into your heart. That should be the fruit of your lips. And love. He's poured his love. It says in Romans 5.5, 5, God has poured his love into your heart. That's what should be coming out of your heart. And I, that, has the, that has the ability to transform other people's lives. And you should be a blessing to everybody. I mean, and you know what? This is not church talk. This is not about what you do on Sunday or what. This is about what you do in life. You are an ambassador for Christ 24-7. Every time you step out into the world, you are that ambassador for God, that ambassador of Christ bringing the knowledge of his presence into every place that you go. And you do it with that love that comes out. Speak love. Otherwise, your words are empty. They have no, they have no purpose. It's jibber-jabber. That's a good saying, huh? Jibber-jabber. Okay. And don't be deceived by empty words. You know, to those very religious people who have rejected him, Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. And Paul would write to the church at Corinth and say, but I'm afraid, and he's talking to the church, he's talking to the believers, and he says, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Second Corinthians 11. You know, we need to be on guard. Otherwise, the wrath of God will come. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Most of the church today doesn't want to hear about the anger of God or the wrath of God. Jesus delighted in the anger of God. The wrath of God is a real thing. We were driving down the highway right here not long ago, and there was a billboard up, a great big billboard, and it says, God is not angry. Really? Really? Look at the world around you. You don't think God has anger? The anger of God, the wrath of God? Paul wrote, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in the righteousness of God is in it, the righteousness of God is revealed, revealed from faith to faith. Revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Romans chapter 1. Go look it up. Read it. That billboard really is. God has a right to be angry. He's a loving God. And all he wants to do is pour out his love on you. But I'm telling you, he requires obedience. God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Romans chapter 5. We've been saved from the, What do you think you were saved from? I mean, do you think it's all about worldly stuff here and now? Not at all. We've been saved from the wrath of God by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So he goes on and says in verse 7 and 8, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Don't be deceived, he wrote. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. I'm telling you, you've got to be, you've got to be on guard. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. Do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now you're light in the, in the Lord. Did you never read the Sermon on the Mount? Have you read the Sermon on the Mount recently? If you have not, go do it. Because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said to the disciples, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. From whom much has been given, much is required. You have been given so, so very much. You've been given the love of God. You've been given salvation. You've been given... It's not about the worldly stuff. Now, God can bless you with worldly stuff. And God may not bless you with worldly stuff. Because there's a goal in our religion. There's a goal in our faith. And that faith is to be present with the Lord. And that's not going to happen here. It's going to happen there. Okay, let me read verses five, uh, chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men. But as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. You know what it means to redeem something? It's to buy it back, right? To buy it back. In Hebrew, they have, the word is goel. A person would be a goel. To go ransom or take back, you know, a, a person who had been in slavery or captured. Talk about abundance. You've been given an abundance of time. You know, I know you've been given the button because you have enough. I don't know if you have more than enough, but you have enough time. Nothing will happen until you accomplish. God just calls you to do something. He'll give you the time to do it. What's more important, money or time? I'm going to tell you something. Talk to anybody who's ever been rich, and I'll tell you, they've lost money. I mean, it's just it's the most unusual thing is to talk to somebody very, very rich and find out that they have not at some point in time lost a bunch of money. But you know what? If you lose money, you can go, you can make it back. You know, if you lose time, you can't make it back. Today, as we're filming this, I believe today is uh, February 26th, the year of our Lord, 2020, that I uh, it's a, it's a Wednesday as we're filming. 
And the fact of the matter is, if I don't use today properly, if I lose today, it's gone forever. If I live, if I live to be 150 years old, which praise God doesn't happen, I would never see another February 26, 2020. You get one, and that's it. You can't get that back. That's precious. It's you're, like I said, you can lose this or lose that, and you you can make it up or you can get it back. You lose time; it's gone forever. So use that time wisely. Use it to bring the love of God into other people's lives. Use it to bring the joy of God into other people's lives. Use it to bring the peace of God into other people's lives. Use it. Are you getting the idea here? It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You carry those things about with you. You carry in you the things that are so desperately needed by the people around you. Do you share it? Do you share it? Do you think you have to be standing behind a pulpit? Do you think you have to be at a table? You are an ambassador for Christ. He has entrusted you with those things. He has entrusted you with his love. He has entrusted you with his joy. He has entrusted you with his peace. You need to use that wisely and share it with others. I, I think I'm going to end there. Uh, I don't want to get cut short, but I did want to ask a question. Now, if this doesn't sound silly to you, you may have noticed that today I'm not wearing a shirt and tie. So I do, do I look more or less holy to you? Put your answer on a postcard or an email and write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and let me know if you think I'm more or less holy. Because man judges by outward appearance, but God searches the heart. I'm telling you, don't look at people based on their outward appearance. Look at them, but more importantly, listen to them. Because the words they speak expose the content of their hearts. And you want to be hanging out with people who have a heart for the Lord. That's all I have to say about that. So, Father, I just thank you that you've trusted us with those things, that you've trusted us with that love, you've trusted us with that peace, that every all the things that you've given us. Lord, I pray that we use them wisely, and not just for ourselves, not at all, Lord, but that we would use them to touch the lives of others for your sake, for your glory. I praise you and thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in my life, for all that you are still doing in my life. And Father, I praise you and thank you for what you are yet to do in my life. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Well, until next week, tell somebody about Jesus. Tell somebody about God's love. Tell somebody about the glory that resides in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you and goodbye and amen. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty.